A very good day to one and all, especially those tuning in. We want to warmly welcome and thank you so much for you participating in our online service. We pray that your time with us will truly be ministered and that you'll be blessed much. For the opening passage, you'll be read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48 as we begin our time together. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, <clears throat> what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? <clears throat> Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let us pray. Thank you, God for choosing us and gave us living hope and an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. What a privilege, what a joy that calls for us to praise you, whatever our circumstances may be, which in your word are temporary. Until Christ's return, you have filled our hearts with inexpressible and glorious joy, for we are receiving the end result of our faith, the salvation of our souls. And so, brothers and sisters and folks out there tuning in, let us ascribe praise to God, our Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now I'd like to invite Mabel to come and lead us in songs of praise. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ tuning in. It is our privilege to be leading you in songs of praise today. We have been learning from the first Peter that we have been chosen as God's holy people and that our salvation was bought by the precious blood of the Lamb. So let us begin this time lifting our voices together and praise the Lord for his obedience and sacrifice. Let us sing together, highest place. Oh, God, it's 
indeed our Lord paid the highest price for us by giving up his place on the throne. And with our lives that we live now, it belongs to him. So with this next song, let us sing it to the Lord as a dedication to tell him that our lives are not our own, but his. Thank you so much, Mabel and the music team, to lead us to understand the incomparable obedience of Jesus Christ to His Father. And it demands for us to respond 
to live increasingly more to be like our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now it's time for our responsive reading. Allow me to read the first slide, and thereafter you respond. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that, though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by Him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. This is the reading of God's Word, His true and holy Word. And we now, I'd like now to draw your attention to what God is doing in our church and ministries for your active prayer and participation. We thank you for joining us in our services. And we know that nothing happens by chance. So you've come to join us because God has orchestrated the circumstances of your life and led you to be part of our gathering from the songs that are sung to the prayers that are prayed and above all, the Word of God that will be explained, that will be taught, that will be proclaimed to you. May you come to know the true and the living God by knowing His Son. And in knowing Him, you will know a God who loves you. It is that love that will set you free from all the hatreds and brokenness of this world. It's the truth of God that will set you free from all the half-truths and the lies of this world. So we pray for the Spirit of God to work in all of our hearts. Our first announcement has to do with our prayer fellowship. Once a month, we gather. We gather to pray. And this week, all of us in Singapore have been brokenhearted by what has happened in one of our schools, River Valley High School. And yet we are undeterred as we look to God. We know as believers and followers of Jesus that we have a living hope. We have an inheritance that can never spoil or fail or perish. And so we go forth listening to God to be His holy people listening to God's call to be a loving people and to be a witness unto Him. So come and join us, for unless we pray, we will have no strength, no power, no endurance to carry on living as the holy people of God. The second announcement has to do with our Just for Newcomers, the acronym JFN. JFN has been used by God over the years to bless hundreds of people who have come to this 13-week course. And in the 13-week course, there are three parts to it you'll firstly be introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. Five studies of this from a gospel. And then we'll take you away and show you the big picture of the Bible at a retreat. And in this spiritual retreat, it'll be a wonderful feasting on God's Word. And then we'll lead you into the seven key essentials of what it means to be a believer and follower of Jesus. Please come and join us. Your life will be so enriched. Your life will be so changed as you come and join us in Just for Newcomers. It begins August the 15th. You need to register for this. Last but not least is our Culinary Arts Ministry. And to celebrate our National Day, we're going to have a special Gula Melaka Strawberry Shortcake. So come along to this. No registrations are needed. There'll be a special message as part of the sweet message of the Gospel and a message by Pastor Jason Craig. Again, invite your family and friends. Don't forget, for all of us here in RPC, to continue memorizing God's Word Continue encouraging each other, the M and E, each week as we meet in our discipleship groups. And don't forget to get together in pairs, in triplets, men to men, women to women, to encourage each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and to grow as a family of God in discipleship. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. Indeed, we want to thank you for taking time to listen to our announcements. And we truly hope that you can join us in all those that have been mentioned. And we'd like to welcome those who are new, right? Uh, I can't really see you, but you know, 
If you are one of those that are just first, for the first time tuning into our online service, or perhaps you have been invited by your friend to his place to watch this uh, online service with us, maybe I could uh, encourage you to um, perhaps download uh, the e-response card from the handbook, sorry, e-handbook, right? And there's a there's an e-response card uh, inside that handbook. Perhaps if you are blessed or maybe you have questions that you want to ask or inquire of us, you may just drop it and send it back to us and we will promptly uh, address um, the, your, your questions that you have, right? And also we would like to take that time to thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this uh, today's uh, online uh, service. Next, uh, we have another announcement to be made. Uh, we pray for your attention, please. We come now to our offering. Our offering is to give to God's workers to complete God's work. And so we ask for your joyful giving as members and regulars of ARPC. If you are new with us, please don't feel obliged to give. Just come and be blessed by the hearing of God's word and the spiritual nuggets that speak to your heart about the Lord Jesus. Don't forget, for our members and our regulars, that we have been given a gift, an ARPC at Tenga, a gazetted place of worship, and it's a different QR code and giving for that. May the Lord bless you as you step out in faith and obedience to be giving to His work generously and cheerfully. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, for bringing our weekly announcements to us for our prayer and participation. Now let us look to God in prayer before I invite the speaker, Pastor Lang Yong, to come and share God's word and bless us. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you to call and praise your great name, to pray and seek your face and confess our wicked ways. Will you not hear us in forgiving our sins and healing our land? We trust that you will because you are exceedingly merciful and abundantly gracious. Please comfort the parents of both the victim and accused of the River Valley incident, River Valley School incident. Grant to them your immeasurable grace. Only you can and bring order into this mess in that school and into our hearts too. Help us to be alert and sober in mind, to live holy lives, to hope, and to love sincerely from our hearts, which are some of the precious lessons gleaned from our study of First Peter. We thank you for blessing To Kong Chien and Eunice Yu as husband and wife, as witnessed by you and their families today. We rejoice and pray that the cords of your great love is in Jesus Christ. Bind them in their blissful and blessful marriage. You, O oh Lord, gives and takes away, and in timeliness have called home Madam Lim Meng Kim, grandmother of our member Tessa Lim. May the bereaved family be comforted and assured that whoever believes in Christ shall not die, but have everlasting life. Lord, from birth to departure and everything between, you assure us of your complete control and hence for us to patiently wait and trust your good and perfect timing. We pray for all our speakers this weekend, namely Pastor Lang Yong, Pastor Yak Chow, Pastor Joe Heng, Pastor Adri Munoz, and a Bible study leader for Tabitha, that you will greatly use them as instruments to speak your unwavering truth, your unmerited grace, your undeserved mercy, and your undying love solely for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Allow me to read the last portion of 1 Peter chapter 2, which is found in verse 18 to 25. Slaves, 
In reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not ret retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. God bless the reading of his word and also the preaching of his word by Pastor Lang Yong. Pastor Lang Yong. for us and thank you so much also for the tech crew they have been working week in week out to ensure that we can still have our gatherings and the hearing of God's word over the internet so before I begin the sermon allow me to pray and dear Heavenly Father we thank you so much for this privilege of reading your word because you said that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from you so may your word be planted deep within us so that we can bear fruit in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today's sermon is called A Strange Liberty. It's taken from 1 Peter chapter 2. On May 4th, 2020, in the midst of Singapore's circuit breaker, to control the COVID-19 infection here, one woman was caught on video refusing to wear a mask in public. And when asked by people around her to comply, she argued with them and explained that she was not obligated to wear a mask because she did not have a contract with our police and they have no say over her. She called herself sovereign. See, the term sovereign gave us clue where the woman got her ideas from. It started from a movement in the United States called the Sovereign Citizen Movement. And followers of this movement, they recognized no other authority but themselves. So they pay no taxes and they are answerable to no one except to themselves. And the video that's gone viral, who, a man who was off screen and he responded to the woman. He said, that, this doesn't even make sense. If you're a person in Singapore, you have to follow the rules of Singapore. But the person replied, that's the thing. I'm not a person. I'm we the people. And then on 23rd February 2021, a Singaporean woman pleaded guilty to abusing her domestic helper from Myanmar, leading to her death. So together with her mother and her husband, under her authority, they will abuse the maid. They burned her with an electric iron, physically attacked her and humiliated her. And they gave her only bread soaked in water or some leftover food. And then every night, they will tie her to the window and allow her only five hours of sleep each day. And after 14 months of abuse, the helper lost 38% of her body weight till she was only 24 kilograms. And finally, she died from severe brain damage. And the CCTV footage obtained by the court showed that the woman, the maid, 
never once retaliated. So these two incidents, my friends, they show the extreme ends of our, our uneasy relationship with authority. Because on the one hand, we recognize the need for authority in society, for law and order. But on the other hand, we are afraid. We are afraid that we'll be subjected to abuse of authority and powerless to defend ourselves. So what does the Bible passage have to tell us today about this? So let's look at the today's passage. So have, we've been reading from a letter of 1 Peter as a church. We've already discussed so far that the letter was written by the Apostle Peter to a group of Christians, and they were scattered through the region of Asia Minor. And because of the Christian faith, they now had a new living hope. And the hope is what sets our life direction and our life goals. Hope that gives us strength to persevere, to continue in the right direction when the going gets tough. And as a Christian hope is that our Lord Jesus has died for our sins and has risen from the dead. And our hope so is not dead. And that one day Jesus will return to put all things right in this world to its proper order as it takes its rightful place as a loving ruler of the world. Thus, this hope sets the Christians apart. It sets the Christians in Peter's time on a head-on collision with the rest of the world. Why? Because the world did not share the same hope. They would behave differently. So how would this look like in daily life for them? In verse 11, we read, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, in the historical context of the letter, Christians were seen as weird, weird people because they behaved strangely, like foreigners, strangers. Because Christians no longer bow down to the same family gods. And Christians no longer join in the parties and the orgies to indulge in sensual desires. And also, the Christians, they were weird. They were gathered for the Lord's Supper, and people misunderstood them to be cannibals, eating flesh and drinking blood. So in the midst of ridicule and persecution, Peter urged Christians not to give up. In their personal life, they were to continue to abstain from sinful desires, and in the public life, they will continue to do good. The unbelievers will in the end be won over to believe in Christ and glorify God on the day of return of Jesus. So what kind of good deed is Peter highlighting in this passage? Verse 13, he says this. He says, Submit, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. You see, the good that Peter was recommending was submission to human authority. Now, this could sound very strange to us because when we think of good deeds, we will think of feeding the poor, saving the turtles or the corals, or fighting for human rights. But submitting to human authority, everyone, this sounds strange. And just as this is shocking to our modern years, it would be probably be shocking too to the early Christians. Why? Because the emperor ruling the empire then, the governors appointed by him to run the provinces, none of these were friendly to the Christians. So why should Christians even submit to them? And here the core of today's passage, Peter gave two reasons. Firstly, he says in verse 14 that the emperor and governors run a system to bring law and order to the lands. They punish the wrongdoers and commend those who do right. So if every person refuses to submit and reinterprets the law according to his own ideas, there will be total chaos. Thus, we are all called to submit to human authorities, then there will be law and order in society. Also, we have read in the book of Ephesians that after raising Christ from the dead, God placed all things under Jesus' feet. So now Jesus is far above all authorities, 
all rulers, both spiritual and human, bringing order to both the heavenly and the earthly realms. This is Jesus' mission. And so human authorities has always been part of God's mission to bring order to his kingdom on earth until Jesus returns. And so we read in Romans 13, Romans 13 verse 1, Paul says this, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Verse 4, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So for Christians, we are to see the human authorities as God's servants. We submit to them as our expression of submitting to God because they're installed over us by God for our own good. You see, in the context, the Roman emperors, they brought access to clean drinking water throughout the entire empire, raising the life expectancy of the Roman people. They also built a government to maintain peace and they built roads and ports for trade to share the wealth. So it was only right for Christians then to submit to the Roman authorities since they were living in that place and they were enjoying all these benefits. So similarly for us, if you want to enjoy the healthcare system of a country, it is only right we will co cooperate by submitting to all the safe management measures, like wearing a mask, so that the healthcare system will not be overwhelmed by mass infections. It is for our own good that we submit. And the other reason Peter gave for submission is in verse 15. He says this, For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. You see, when Peter wrote these lines, emperor worship was a widespread practice. The imperial cult, he treats the supreme leader as a divine being, as a god. It was a unifying factor for the entire Roman Empire, hoping to obtain loyalty from the center in Rome all the way to the far-flung provinces. And this picture over here, it shows what we call the apotheosis of Emperor Antonius and his wife, Faustina, where here his one emperor and his wife were transformed into gods. And this is taken in AD 161. So naturally, for Christians, they did not participate in such emperor worship, for they would not consider him as God. So those who were ignorant of the Christian faith, they were accused Christians as what? As anti-establishment. Therefore, in this context, Peter exhorted his fellow believers to submit, to submit to Roman authorities in areas where the system was good for society. Thus, this would silence the accusations of anti-establishment. And so for us, those among us who grew up in more traditional Chinese families, such a dynamic would not be unfamiliar. Why, you see, in a traditional Chinese family, the authority of parents are highly esteemed as that the rulers of the land because the family unit is the building block of the country. And this is captured in a Chinese saying. It says, Guo you guo fa, jia you jia gui. And it's basically saying that the country has its own laws, and so each family has its own regulations you have to obey. And so during a typical Chinese funeral, the family members of the deceased are required to show their filial piety by participating in religious rituals that were meant to ensure that the departed one will have a good afterlife. But Christians would find it very hard to do so because very often, these rituals require us to submit to another religious leader of another religion and to bow down to the statues of other gods. And so, from the family perspective, the non-compliant Christian was seen as unfilial, uncooperative, and anti-establishment. And in such cases, similar to the believers under Roman rule, Chinese Christians would be encouraged to what? 
to do good, to serve the family, like helping the logistics of the funeral, serving refreshments to the guests, and doing the night duties, the night watch. In short, Christians show their allegiance to God by not participating in the rituals, but we can still be pro-establishment in all other aspects of the funeral as part of showing honour to the deceased and to the remaining family. And why do we do this? Chapter 2, verse 16, Peter says, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Because we have now been set free by God. Free from what? Free from being addicted to our sins. Free from our fear of death. And free from superstition. So now we can use our freedom to serve others, to live as God's slaves. So this may sound strange to our ears. Why? Because our modern concept of freedom is simply liberty to do whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want, with a plain, simple goal of filling our minds and our bodies with pleasures and happiness. But think about it. The modern liberty is no different from a spoiled brat insisting on getting whatever he wants. From the Bible's perspective, this is not liberty. This is poverty because it is bankrupt of any good and it will only lead to disorder in society and mutual destruction when we all insist in our own ways on being narcissists caring only for ourselves. So instead, according to the Bible, true liberty is when we become what? When we become slaves of God, serving others willingly. And this is the strange liberty that Peter has been writing about. So I remember when my grandfather passed away, one of his church elders came for the wake. And this church elder was a respected older sister in Christ. And she sat down and she saw my father and she spoke with my father. And my dad, being the cheeky one, he took the chance to tease and to insult the Christian faith. However, this elder did not take any offence. She did not take umbrage at my father's insults. Instead, she kindly and patiently responded every question and continued to speak with my father. And after my, the funeral, my father was so impressed by her kindness that he actually dressed up himself neatly, took the bus all by himself just to attend service at that church. You see, my brothers and sisters, Christians have been set free to become what? Become slaves. Bring, being free persons, we can now set aside our rights and choose to serve others. This is true freedom. Only then can we win people over to Christ. Verse 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. So the next question we may ask is this. So, Pastor, what if the authorities are bad and unjust? Should we still submit to them? So this brings us to the next few verses. Verse 18, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. In this verse, Peter is saying that we are to submit to all authorities placed over us, whether the person wielding the authority, the power, is nice toward us or not. And this is done out of what? Out of reverent fear of God. This means we are submitting to the human authorities because we must give an answer to God for our lives, for our actions. And Peter addressed this portion to slaves. Just in case we think that it's not applicable to us because we are not slaves, we need to clarify that Peter was referring to a certain class of people they are, not, they are very different from our modern-day slaves. He was referring to people being, he was not referring to people being kidnapped and put to unwilling labor, unable to redeem their freedom. Instead, 
He was referring the people in the Greek word he used to household servants, people who were highly skilled professionals, managers, and they sold themselves willingly to a master, all in the hope of social mobility. Because in the future, when they were able to save enough money and purchase their freedom, then they'll be ranked higher in the social class, higher than the peasants. And so our modern-day equivalent in Singapore would be the government scholars being bonded for a time, hoping to climb the corporate ladder, and then they can become the authorities to tell you how to wear your mask. But in some ways, all of us are slaves, if you think about it, because we have sold ourselves about 40 to 50 years of your life to your employer to do their bidding in exchange for salary and promotion. And so for all of us, we are called to submit to our bosses, even when they treat us unjustly or harshly. Why? Verse 19, For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. So Peter's point is very simple. He said, don't get punished for doing wrong. There's nothing praiseworthy of that at all. Instead, if you were to suffer, then make sure you suffer for doing good. Because we are God's children, we are called to be different. And this echoes what the Lord Jesus taught. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, he says this, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, because he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And verse 46, If you love those who love you, what will you, what will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, why are you doing more than others? Do not even unbelievers, the pagans, do that. And verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, even non-believers can submit to nice bosses. What makes Christians stand out then is whether we can submit to bad bosses and suffer for it. Peter reiterates this point later in chapter 3, verse 9. He says this, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because this, to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. So the heart of today's passage is this. Christians are called to a higher calling, to bless even the ones who cause us to suffer unjustly. And we see this throughout the Bible, just like how, for example, Joseph was sold to slavery and he suffered false accusations and yet he still chose to be a blessing for those who enslaved him. Or how Daniel, he gave his best to serve the foreign kings when he was in exile, cruel kings that took him captive and destroyed his homeland. This, my friends, is our Christian calling. So previously, I worked as a lecturer in the Polytechnic and we were launching a new course. So we spent hours doing research, producing the class materials, and we taught the students as best as we could. The student feedback was good and the team had a great morale. Then came a new boss and he had very different goals for our department, to say the least. So one morning, he called me on the phone and asked, say, Lak Yong, will you be free this afternoon? So I checked my calendar quickly and said, yes, I'll be. And then he said, good, I need you to come to my office today, this afternoon to interview someone, someone who will be replacing you. So I was silent for a while. And my new boss cheerfully added, you see, it's because I need someone really good. Then I said, okay. So this conversation was starting to give a whole new meaning to the phrase career suicide. And I said, yes, but thankfully, the person did not turn up for the interview, and so I kept the job for a day. But that evening, I could not eat. I could not even hug my wife. 
to say the least, I was so angry. Because this new boss, he just joined us. He did not check the student feedback records. He didn't even saw what we did over the months. It just wasn't fair. I was so angry at the injustice. At the same time, I was so fearful of losing my job. So I poured out my heart to my wife. And the phrase I kept repeating to her was, it's just not fair, it's not fair. By the end of the evening, she was very patient and she only gently replied. She said, you know, Lark, it wasn't fair either for Jesus to go to the cross. And that shut my mouth and I stopped complaining. What was I thinking? My little suffering is nothing compared to my Lord Jesus. Compared to being nailed to a cross, this was just a finger prick. Peter wrote from verse 21, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Jesus, he clearly did no wrong, and yet he suffered immensely. It was a totally unjust suffering. He was completely innocent, yet he died for the sins that we committed. He died for us, we who hated him. That was completely unfair for him. And so the example of Jesus completely humbled me. Verse 23, when they heard uh, insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Furthermore, Jesus did not retaliate nor make any threats. Why? You see, it's so hard. When we go through unjust suffering, we are so tempted to retaliate, to take vengeance. Because to retaliate means we are putting all our hopes in our ability to protect ourselves, to avoid the same suffering again. Because the pain we go through is so great that we don't want to relieve the, relieve the same nightmare over and over again. So we make threats, we make preparations, we fight back. But Jesus did not retaliate. How did our Lord do that? Peter continued in verse 23, Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus trusted that his Father would vindicate him. Ultimately, my friends, submission for Christians is an act of faith. Submission is an act of faith. To trust that we have a Father in heaven who knows all things and judges all things, so we do not retaliate. And that night, after the reminder from my wife Esther, I prayed to forgive my new boss. I prayed in my heart to bless him from the bottom of my heart. I closed my eyes. I saw him happy in my mind. And then I was released from the pain and I could hug my wife again. Amazingly, a few months later, I got promoted and became part of the middle management. So I got closer to my new boss. And for the next few years, I, God enabled me to work under him, empowering me to bless him every day. And our relationship greatly improved. So this is one of many small lessons that God used to teach me, to trust him, so that I can obey him, to follow Jesus step by step. Submission is an act of faith. So we have seen so far from Scripture the goodness of submission. We have also seen that it's a call to trust God so that we can go through unjust suffering. But at the same time, it's highly important for us to know that God did not call Christians to be a doormat for people to walk all over us. Instead, look at what Jesus said. He said, be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. He does not endorse abuse in any form. Because usually in an abusive relationship, the abused, the person who was abused, tends to worship the abuser as God. Because the abused fears the abuser and so allow himself to be abused as a result. But the Bible calls us not to fear man, but to fear God. The submission here that we are called to do is a result of fearing God and not because we fear man. So let's look at Jesus' example in the Gospels. 
Once he was back in his hometown, and the crowd did not like what he preached. And they became furious and they wanted to throw him off a cliff. However, Jesus did not allow himself to be thrown off the cliff. He simply walked through the crowd and went on his way. Why? Because his death at that point would have been meaningless and fruitless. In contrast, Jesus died on the cross willingly, without retaliation. When he was questioned by the authorities, he did not fear them. In fact, he knew exactly he was doing God's will when he suffered. And this means that Jesus' death and suffering on the cross was not meaningless, it was not random. He allowed it to happen for a purpose, with a clear intention. Verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness, and by his wounds you have been healed. Jesus' death on the cross was unjust, but it was not unintentional. It was an event that prophets predicted, that angels longed to see. Jesus proactively became the ultimate sacrificial lamb, the scapegoat that took our punishment in our place. It was his intention to bless us even though we had hated him and that our sinful and dirty souls are healed by his cleansing blood to wash us clean, to change our hearts so that we will want to hear God's voice and follow his call. Verse 25, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Friends, so this passage, you must be very clear, is not an order for us to passively let ourselves be abused. Rather, it is a call to roll up our sleeves, as they say in Greek, to gird up the loins of our minds so that we can be proactively getting ready to serve and bless others, even, those, even towards those who have done us wrong. Let us obey God, our great shepherd, at all costs. That's what Peter is saying. And interestingly, when we survey the rest of the Bible, sometimes to call to obey God at all costs would mean to disobey the authorities above us. For example, when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh, the king, wanted the Hebrew midwives to kill off the baby boys so that he could exterminate the Hebrew race. But what happened? What happened is my tablet freezed. Can I have the hard copy? What happened is recorded for us in Exodus chapter 1, verse 17. It says here, the midwives, however, they feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And similarly, in the Old Testament, when King Darius set a law for all to bow down to him and worship him as God, Daniel did not. And he openly defied the order and was thrown into the lions as a result. So how do we make sense of it all? Should we submit or not submit to authorities. If we look carefully at the Bible, we see a common theme throughout. And the real issue here is not whether we should submit or not submit. The real issue here is whether we obey God even to the point of suffering. And sometimes to obey God, it means to submit. And at other times to obey God, it means not to submit. And those who could obey God it was because they did not place their hope in life, in this life, in this world, but they placed their hope in God. So recently, during the heightened alert, we will take our kids out every day to the parks to take their eyes off the computer screens, and this is what we saw one day. And we saw an insect that looked so similar to a dried-up leaf. It was so well camouflaged that we had fun as a family in the family outing, trying to find the other bugs that were camouflaged. See, camouflage 
is one effective coping mechanism in the world. Blend into the environment, and the insect is hidden away from the eyes of danger. Unfortunately, in the midst of suffering and persecution, we might simply cave into our fears, and so we camouflage with the rest of the world, blending in with their values and practices. In such times, we could be submitting out of the wrong reason. It's not because we are godly, but because we just want to avoid suffering. We are cowardly. In 1906, German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born. He lived only 40 years, but he left footprints of courage beyond his lifetime. As a pastor and theologian, Bonhoeffer saw that the Christian church as a community that is in the world, yet not of it. Christians, he wrote, are strangers and aliens in a foreign land, enjoying the hospitality of their land and obeying its laws and honouring its government. He was a pacifist at heart, gentle as a dove. However, the German nation of his time was suffering, suffering humiliation and economic depression from the loss of the First World War. And so they were so tired of the bad times that the nation began to listen to the voice of one man, a charismatic Adolf Hitler. Hitler promised them the rise of the great nation of Germany. And then the Christians, they went along. And some pastors even preached that Hitler was sent by God to help Christ redeem the German nation. And um, however, among a few other pastors, Bonhoeffer saw through the lies of Hitler. In response to the situation, he wrote, he wrote this, cheap grace. He said, cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, and cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. He coined the term cheap grace because there was a lack of discipleship in the Christians then. They were no longer salt and light of the world. The German church did not place their hope in the glory of God, but the hope was placed in the restoration of the German economy and glory. And he tried so hard to change the church from within, but that proved to be impossible. So in the end, he had to change tactics he joined the German secret service to be a double agent in order to spy on the Nazis. And with the new information, it helped him to rescue Jews from oppression. And in the end, he was also part of the conspiracy, the plot to assassinate Hitler. Why did he change from being a pacifist to a conspirator? And this is what he said famously, if I see a madman driving a car into a group of innocent bystanders. Then I can't, as a Christian, simply wait for the catastrophe and then comfort the wounded and bury the dead. I must try to wrestle the steering wheel out of the hands of the driver. In the writings, Bonhoeffer did not expect everyone to do what he was doing. See, to him, everyone was to act according to his own calling, his own vocation. But for him, he felt he had to obey God in wanting to submit to authorities initially, seeing the good in them. But when they turned bad, he tried to change the system from within, but he failed. And finally, with the increasing evil of the Hitler's regime, he has expressed his obedience to God by attempting to remove Hitler. Unfortunately, the plot was discovered and Bonhoeffer was sent to prison for a few years, and then he was finally executed just one month before the defeat of Germany in World War II. In prison, he wrote this. He said, It is not the religious act that makes the Christian, but the participation in the sufferings of God in the secular life. So what he's saying is, it is not what we do when we attend church that makes us Christians, my friends. He says our identity as Christians is confirmed when we obey God in our everyday lives, even to suffer for it. So my brothers and sisters, the question then 
is not whether we should submit or not submit, but whether we want to be Christ's disciples and suffer for it. You see, the world swings between two extremes. Either one does not submit because he prioritizes his own happiness above all things. Or he will submit just to protect his own happiness. Such a person of these two extremes is still a slave to his own happiness. But for the disciples of Jesus, we have been set free, free from fear to become Christ's slave, to obey God whatever the cost. So then out of the fear of God, we see every human authority instituted over us by God for our own good. So we submit proactively, proactive to bless them, help them to rule, and even those who are harsh and unjust towards us. However, when your human authority calls us to do evil, to disobey God, then out of fear of God, we should draw the line and not give in to the fear of men, even if this means we have to suffer for it. This is what it means to be God's slave. This is what it means to be free, free from the fear of men to do what is right. And so for us as Singapore, most of us, I must emphasize, do not have Adolf Hitler as your boss. So please, after the sermon, don't go home and pretend and try to plot and remove your boss. This is not the application. Instead, you have to prayerfully choose to bless him instead. At the same time, in Singapore, we do not live under an emperor who imposes his rule over us. Instead, we have a democracy where people appoint our leaders. And so there is room for political discussion and differences for Christians serving in both the ruling party as well as the opposition. But the biblical principle for us is the same. Obey God. Submit to human authorities. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. And win them over to Christ at all costs. Finally, my brothers and sisters, you may disagree with my understanding of, in this issue from the Bible, but whether you agree with me or not, may I show you proper respect. May I love you sincerely and deeply, and may I honour you appropriately. But most importantly, may we grow together not to fear men, but to fear only God. May we not abuse our freedom as a cover-up for evil, but may we enjoy our strange liberty to become God's slaves. And so by His Word and Spirit, may we grow to become more and more like our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for loving us even when we were Your enemies. So help us to love our enemies too, to follow in the footsteps of Your Son, Jesus. And when we are fearful of men, may Your Spirit bring us courage and peace, so that we do not fear men, but to fear you, to live with our lives in awe of you, so that we can be set free from fear and to love others and to do good. And even those who do not believe, when they see us, we pray that one day they will give glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lang Yao, for this challenging message. As indeed, as followers of Christ, we endure suffering by doing good, so that by grace we might win some for the Lord. Let us close uh, with this song as a reminder and a prayer that we are servants of the gospel. new life might begin as 
servants of the gospel, Christ's work we carry on, that through our prayer and witness, by grace we might win some, we call on every nation to turn to Christ the Lord, refuge in His mercy and mercy. not contain him from death the son broke free exalted by his father to rule eternally and in his grace he calls us to be his chosen church as his holy temple his priest to all the earth as children of the gospel Christ's work we carry on, that through our prayer and witness, by grace we might win some, we call on every nation to turn to Christ the Lord, refuge in His mercy, and marvel at His standing as we receive the benediction. May the love of the God our Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, so that we do not fear men, but to fear God, and live in the strange liberty of being God's slaves. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for the online service. Hope it's an encouraging time for you, and same time next week, we'll see you again.